Marsha McCroffley, one of the governors of Westchester County. We welcome you tonight. Thank you that you're coming to this event rather than watch the Mets game. It's <laughs> a big thing here. <laughs> Having the Mets in the series. Um, I would like to encourage you to turn off your cell phone, and I will do that to mine as soon as I get back to my seat because I forgot to do that. It is disruptive, and we just ask that you be courteous to the candidates. And also, tonight, remember we're here to hear from the candidates, so when you ask your question from the audience, that it be brief. We have a very full slate of candidates, which means we can't get as many questions as we normally have had in the past because. You know, five people will be answering the questions for the village trustee candidates. So please be courteous about that. And we have a moderator from Newcastle, Roberta Warnick, and our timekeeper is Betsy Weiner. They're both league members. And we hope to have a lively discussion. We always do here in Oslo. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, and may I add my welcome? Can you hear me? No. no, no. no. Is that better? Okay. Can't see you. Oh. How's that? Okay. Uh, this evening we have actually uh, three debates. And for, um, well, we had three different elections. The town council for the town of Austin, uh, the ninth state assembly district. New York State, and uh, the village of Austin for trustees and mayor. Uh, those candidates that are un uncontested will be permitted to make a statement. Uh, only the candidates in contested elections will be allowed to debate and answer questions. Uh, the format for this evening will be uh, the contested candidates will have one and a half minutes for an opening and a closing statement. Uh, the order was chosen by lottery. Uh, questions uh, to the contested candidates, they will be asked a question from the lead, a lead question, and then we will open questions from the floor. Um, and you will have designated response time. The timekeeper will signal when, they, when the speaker has 30 seconds remaining. And then again, when it is time to stop, and we will appreciate you abiding by these time limits so that it is fair to everyone. Our first candidate this evening um, is for the uh, town council for the town of Austin. It is to fill one year in a remaining uh, unexpired term, ending in 2007, and it's uncontested. And the candidate is Martha Dodge, running on the Democratic Working Families and Independent Parties. Uh, and she will make a three-minute statement. I would like to thank the League of Women Voters of Westchester for their contribution to voter information and for inviting me to this candidate's forum tonight. I was appointed to the Austin Town Council in February. I applied for the open council member position because much of my life here in Austin has been devoted to volunteer activities and the betterment of life in our town, our village, and our schools. My background is in the media. I know that planning is the most important step to contain the cost of any project or undertaking. Since moving to Austin 19 years ago, I have served with the school's PTAs at all levels, I serve on the board of directors of the Interfaith Council for Action and know how important the issues of housing and appropriate social services are for our working families and their children. I work with the Westchester Ballet Company and the La Brea Dance Academy. I see how vital the arts are in our community and how these organizations reach out to the residents of other communities and bring them here to Osme. I also worked for four years as the site manager at the Ossamy Farmers Market. I know how well this weekly gathering helps to build the community. Since my appointment, I have worked with members of the Ossamy Town Council to enact stormwater management legislation, improve town law on quality of life issues, and participated in the Office of Homeland Security training seminars. I have joined my colleagues in ongoing projects in Engle Park, 
improving the service and facilities in the highway department, and in reviewing our current intermunicipal agreements. I will continue to work with the villages of Ossining and Briarcliff to better serve taxpayers and maintain services. I would like to look beyond town borders to see how other towns are providing quality services to their communities without taking on higher property tax burdens and keeping their communities affordable for everyone. I'm an advocate of smart growth. Traffic, noise, development, affordable housing, and infrastructure are all issues of high priority. I propose to continue to review the Town of Austin Comprehensive Plan that was adopted in 2002. I will continue to make our public parks a destination for recreation, reflection, and enjoyment. I will work to further enact stormwater management legislation to clean up our waterways in town and manage any new development so it will not adversely impact on the properties around it. I would also like to look at new energy saving technologies and how they can be incorporated into the day-to-day -day workings of the town of Osme. In closing, I would like to thank the residents of the town of Osme for the opportunity that I have had to serve and ask that you vote for me to continue the work that I have begun. Thank you. next candidate is running for the New York State 90th Assembly District. A two-year term is uncontested. Uh, this district represents Portland, Austin, Peekskill, and Port of Putnam County. And Sandra Gala is that candidate running on the Democratic Working Families ticket. She will now make a statement. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, again, thank you to the League for having this uh, candidates night. It's so important for our community that you're here. And uh, as I look forward um, to a new session in Albany, there are several issues that I'd like to highlight tonight that I really want to work on on your behalf. And one of that, unfortunately, is the whole issue of taxes. Uh, we have been noted in the last, um, I guess in the last week, that Westchester County is the highest tax county in the country. And New York State is one of the highest tax states in our country. We have to do something about this. And as the uh, chair of the Real Property Taxation Committee in the Assembly, one of the things I am working on is trying to, uh, to figure out if there's a better way for us to fund our schools. Should we be looking, instead of the property tax which we now pay, to have an opportunity to divide that property tax into both property and income, uh, have a balance, have a different kind of a distribution? Or should we do, as the League of Women Voters has just come out with, a proposal that we raise our personal income tax level and fund our schools that way so it's on income? which uh, you know, has, has a much fairer representation to that. Also, um, there's the whole issue of whether a circuit breaker would help us. And we have a circuit breaker in effect right now in New York State, but it doesn't really function very well because um, the level is so low, and whether we should encourage that, which would mean if you, if you spend a greater percentage of your income for your school tax, that you would get assistance from the state of New York. Um, so those are all the things that we really need to work on. Uh, we tried to help this year. You will be getting in Westchester County, because we're doing it alphabetically by counties, you're going to be getting your check in the mail uh, from the STAR program. And it's on average a third of what you get for your STAR program when you get your school bills. Uh, so those are coming to, to the community very shortly, and that's our way in the state of saying, you know, we're trying to be of assistance. Um, but in addition to the how we tax schools, we really have to look at how we spend the money within the schools. And we have to develop a plan that we can start to share services, that we can rid our schools of some of the mandates that may sound very good, but we can't afford them any longer. And this is going to be something that we all have to work on together, because the only way we can change things is to have change. And, um, and and that's going to be uh, a priority issue for me as, as I go forward working on your behalf in Albany. Also, one of the other things that I will continue to work on is reforming New York State. We've had some we've had some good things that have happened in the last two years. You may have noticed we had on-time budgets for two years in a row. Now that resulted because we had joint conference committees, Senate and Assembly working together. 
And we need to institutionalize that so it always happens, and it always happens for all other kinds of legislation where each house has adopted legislation, but we haven't come to an agreement. Let's sit down around a table and get something done. Secondly, uh, I think it's key that we have an independent budget office in the state of New York so we know fiscally every bill that comes before us, what is it costing us as New Yorkers if we pass that legislation. Also, I'd just like to hit on member items. $200 million are in the state budget for member items. For those of you, they're legislative initiatives, they're money that are given to legislators to hand out in their district. Uh, of this $200 million, not everybody gets an equal share. And I think if we do have it, that every senator and every assembly person should have an equal share. And there should be a period of time when you cannot go around handing out a check in your community at least 60 days before an election or even more than that so that you're not using public dollars to run your own campaign. And I think we really have to think about changing that whole process. Uh, I will work on these two issues, and uh, I look forward to being your representative in Albany, and I hope that you will check my name when you go out to vote on Election Day. Thank you very much. Would all of the uh, candidates But all of the candidates. There's one more. I'm Oh, yes, there is. <laughs> you have another statement. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was going to see everybody and then have you, but that's all right. Oh, no, no. no. Uh, we have one more statement from a candidate for trustee for the village of Austin uh, for filling one year of a two year term. Suzanne Donnelly is running on the Democratic ticket. She will now make a three-minute state. I, too, would like to thank the League of Women Voters for having us here this evening. I have been involved in this community for most of the 22 years that I've lived here. As most of you are aware, the youth of our community, which, which I'm very involved with, is our future and our most valuable asset. My involvement in the local Boy Scout troop over the last over 10 years, the Interact Club at the high school, as well as the creation of the Youth of Austin Project, all which encourage our youth to develop skills as well as high adventure to combat stress and anxiety, have been rewarding, as rewarding to me as it has been to them. Hands-on service projects for local, national, and international causes shows our youth that service and giving back to the community can be as much fun as whitewater rafting. I feel privileged to be part of this program. The Rotary has been a fantastic experience for me and has shown me that service above self and hands-on projects are, are very important to both the community, community and to uh, the national and international. For the village, I see my role as being to bring entrepreneurial practices to the village government. Another priority would be neighborhood preservation while encouraging balanced growth to keep taxes in check. I will work to leverage the talents and resources of various governments in order to, excuse me, in order to improve the quality of life while improving efficiencies. I will continue, would like to continue the New England style of town meetings that I have encouraged and have been successful. At the Austin Boat and Canoe Club, the members and residents were allowed to voice their concerns over a village dock that would be available for the residents as well as the commuters. The seniors were thrilled to see the new pool area as well as make their suggestions for programs and functions in 2007. Preserving open space and creating recreational opportunities for the whole village is something that I will encourage and assist in as much as possible. Lastly, I would like to use my skills in operational management to work with the village administrator, administration to bring access to programs at lower cost via the internet and software packages. These are not, el these are not to eliminate jobs, but to make our productive staff even more efficient. And I want to thank you all and uh, hope you vote for me. Thank you. All right, now I'll see the candidates. The village of Austin trustees, please come forward.
introduce to you um, the candidates uh, for Billy DeVos named the trustee. Um, they're in order. Of, yeah. Okay, they are in order. Uh, starting at the far end, Catherine Borgia, Marlene Cheatham, Marcia Gagliardi, no, Maria. Maria Gagliardi, Stephen Kern, and Anthony Farisi. Uh, they have drawn lots. And they will each make an opening statement of two minutes. And our first speaker will be Anthony Paris. Um, good evening, and I want to thank the League of Women Voters for having us here. Um, my name is Tony Parisi. Um, I've been in Austin since uh, 1954, uh, had businesses in Austin for many, many years. Um, uh, also, I was in the Navy for four years, went to Austin High School. Um, well, I guess I'm the only Republican sitting up here. I'm looking uh, at my uh, friends on my right here, and uh, I guess that I'm here because I think we needed to give the voters somebody to vote for. Un unlike uh, the uh, town of Bossing, it seems like the town always runs unopposed, um, and I don't think that's good for the village or the town. I think it's good to have um, people to vote for, and I think we got a great uh, amount of people this time to vote for. We got uh, five and only two seats, so I think we're going to you know, give the public a lot to uh, think about. And for the next election, uh, for this election coming up uh, in November, I just hope that everyone gets out and votes and uh, know where we're all going. Thank you very much. All right. Our next speaker will be Marlene Cheatham. Good evening. I would also like to take this time to thank the League of Women Voters for um, hosting us tonight. Um, and as many of you know, I am a native of Austin and a graduate of the Austin School Systems. I do have a bachelor's and a master's degree in psychology from Mercy College in Doss Ferry, and I am com um, completing my first term in office. Um, I am currently on the board of directors for IFCA and a member of the Recreation Advisory Board for the Village. I was also just recently named for the board of directors for the Clearview School. With that said, there are a number of issues that I have worked on and resolved in the past, but there are still some issues here in the village which cause me great concern and call for a greater level of involvement. And they include, but are not limited to, public safety and the police department. Um, reaching back into history, we know that petty crime and quality of life issues respond well to face-to-face -face relationships between police personnel and the Austin residents. I want to continue to push for increased community policing, and as the board liaison for the police department, I will continue to work closely with the police department and provide superior police service. I also want to look at affordable housing. As a, on the board of directors of IFCA and as a person who um, is very much concerned about affordable housing, I want to continue to look at affordable housing within Austin, um, not only middle class, low class, working class, but affordable housing for everyone um, throughout the Westchester area. Um, and I will continue to push for affordable housing for the projects that come to the board. And lastly, um, to look at the taxes. Um, the, um, as stated before, taxes are a problem throughout Westchester, throughout the state. Um, and I think that we all need to look at that in a, on a closer level. And last but not least, um, I want, to know, want everyone to know that um, I look for open and honest government and want to continue to work to make Austin the best community that is on the Hudson. Thank you. Our next speaker, Our next speaker is Maria Gagliardi. It's Gagliardi. I'm sorry. Gagliardi. 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 <laughs> if you're in Italy, it's Gagliardi. Gagliardi. Well, it's okay. Here it's Gagliardi also. Um, I have lived in Austin for 49 years. I had extensive experience in government accounting and finance. I served as Austin Town Controller in the administrations of three Democrat Town Supervisors, Louis Engel, Richard Wishney, and William Burton, and as the twice-selected receiver of taxes 
until my retirement in 2001. I am running for village trustee because I am distressed by the direction in which Austin is going. I support rational planning and the need to have a comprehensive master plan in place before the construction of any more luxury housing. There are 770 high-end units in the planning stages, but only rhetoric about what the residents really need and want, affordable housing and the revival of Main Street. Rents are skyrocketing. There is no rent control or stabilization. I support immediate enactment of the ETPA or rent control, as is already the law in 20 other Westchester communities. Our waterfront has been taken from the people and given to developers for a massive high-end luxury housing project. As already proven by other luxury developments in Austin, construction of high-end housing does not bring in enough revenue to provide the necessary service and also revitalize the downtown. My running mates, Don D. Barr, Steve Kern, and I proposed that the seven-year vacant bank building sitting at the corner of Spring and Main be developed as a mixed-use building which includes retail shops and a movie theater. I do not yet another prison museum. I believe in the protection of Austin's historic character and infrastructure. No more post office or 95 Main Street buildings. Finally, I believe the public has a right to question decisions by public officials without being disrespected. Thank you. And now Stephen Kern. Good evening. Uh, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for this forum. I'm Stephen Kern. I've lived in Austin for 22 years, married, have three children, gone through the Austin school system all the way up. Uh, I'm a union lawyer. That's my background. I've been professionally concerned with the concerns of working people and representing working people for uh, close on to two decades now. And I do believe I am very in touch with those concerns. The reason I'm running is that I've seen in the last couple of years that it seems to me a small clique controlling the village government, which unfortunately has been too lacking in ideas and, and envisioned for the village to make the kind of progress that I think we can make. And I think that Marie Galliardi and Don DeBoer and I uh, have a good shot at doing better. I support and we support good rational planning uh, that would be planning our comprehensive planning process. The, 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 the people on the board have been basically only responding to criticisms of how planning turned out in Harbor Square and how it's in effect thrown out the window, uh, resulting in the, fi the fiasco there, the Hunter James project, the Austin Savings Bank building sitting empty there for years at Main and Spring Street. I think to have the planning process go forward with the people who are, are controlling it now is like the fox guarding the hen house. I support a moratorium on large, dense residential development, not to affect small uh, residential development, not to affect commercial development, but on large, dense residential development until we decide where we want to put it. We can work out the parameters for that type of thing with the input of people, and I believe that we can take the input of people in respectful dialogue with people who have different opinions, something that we've seen not enough of. I strongly support downtown revival service, show people want it, we want to have a vibrant downtown. There have been years of promises. There has been some progress, but there has not been enough progress. We all know that there are big holes downtown. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. Um, I would also like to say thank you to the League of Women Voters. As a League member, I certainly hold the ideals of the League of Open Government and and thoughtful um, analysis of issues to be to be a goal for for me in my public service. I'd also really like to thank the residents of the village of Osne. I think that this first term on the village board has been uh, it's been a privilege and an honor to serve the residents of the village. Um, I know that we all love the village of Osne, and it's it's been a pleasure to work with residents to hear residents' dreams and hopes and ideas for what they want to see in the village. I think that's been one of the most exciting things that my colleagues and I have found on the village board. We are all, uh, with the exception of uh, Mayor Hernandez, we are all relatively new board members and we are all um, 
learning our, our way, and it's been very helpful to have the participation of many residents on committees, uh, answering the survey for the comprehensive plan, and also your willingness to really come up to us and, and tell us, tell us your ideas, tell us what you want. It's a real pleasure of campaigning to be able to speak to people about how they envision the future. And I really think it's been a tremendous two years. We've had a real record of accomplishment. All of our promises that we made during the 2004 campaign, we have either kept or made significant progress on. Um, the Comprehensive Plan Committee, which has already been mentioned here, is a tremendous group of diverse residents who have done uh, just an extraordinary amount of work and are really moving forward in a very exciting way. I think that we've seen a turnaround in how our village is uh, seen by other villages, by our residents, and by our employees. And there's a lot of hope and optimism in the village. It's been a pleasure uh, to be out on the campaign trail and, and to hear that. So I would like to conclude by saying um, thank you again for all of your help. I ask you to vote for myself and for my colleagues, Marlene Cheatham, Susan Do Suzanne Donnelly, and Bill Hanauer. I think that we're uh, making progress, working together with the residents, and that we have a very bright future here in Austin. Thank you. We now have a question from the League of Women Voters. Um, if you are to be elected, what would be your plans for affordable housing for Austin's workforce? We will do it in reverse, starting with the board. Okay. Um, well, of course, this has been a priority of, of the sitting board for the two years that we've been in office. We've made several advancements on creating an affordable housing policy that would require uh, all development, new development and redevelopment in the village to have a set aside of 10% of affordable housing. I guess the tricky part is that in the village of Osney, we don't only need affordable housing as defined um, by the county, which is 80% of median income. We need affordable housing at every level. So we've been working very closely with residents and with um, the Housing Action Council to develop a plan that we can codify into law. We hope to have that done by the end of this year. Uh, to ensure that we have housing at every level that we need it here in the village of Osney. So we're going to continue on with that with that program and and continue to we, we have several projects in the works that do include affordable housing and we'll continue to work with the county and the developers to make sure that they get those. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Kern. Affordable housing is an issue that uh, I give a lot of priority to, and uh, I think that it's important to note that uh, I'm committed and my partners are committed, uh, not just in the, in the couple of months leading up to the election, but this is something that we've been talking about at board meetings for going on two years now, of course, at uh, Claremont, the alarm went out about it going to market rate about two years ago, and it went to market rate about a year ago, and it's only really in the last couple of months that we're starting to hear uh, developments about policies towards affordable housing uh, and, and moving towards legislation. So I think uh, that it's important to have people on the board who have a commitment. I think that we can do a, a good job at looking at the set-asides uh, when, when there's development towards affordable housing and the, and the loopholes and the money in lieu of affordable housing. I think that uh, we will take a hard look at those kinds of things and see that it doesn't become a way of affordable and work housing not developing. And by the way, the uh, usage of the uh, Austin definition for affordable housing rather than the Westchester County definition of affordable housing is a point that Friends of the Master Plan, a group of which I and Marie and Don DeBar are members, uh, have been calling for the usage of a definition that reflects incomes rather than the county incomes for quite a long time now. And so that's something that we have raised. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maria Gagliari. Um, I agree with everything that Steve said. Um, I've been a resident of Austin, as I said, for 49 years. And when we purchased our house, it was three times the breadwinner's salary. The wife's salary was not even considered. That was the rule of thumb. And if a man made $10,000, you could buy a house for $30,000. This is not so here. 
someone earns 100000 there is no way you can buy a house in Westchester County for $300,000. I think that the village has to set the criteria as to what they want the developers to do. And I don't think it's the developers who tell us what they're going to do. In the last decade or more, I have seen nothing but luxury housing going up. We have we lost two sites that where affordable housing could have been put up, but we lost it to high-end housing and McMansions. I think that you have to have a strong village board with a strong policy, and you set the criteria for the developers, not the developers setting the criteria for the village. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gina. Um, contrary to popular belief, this village board has been sitting for two years and we have been working very hard at looking at our affordable housing policy, um, looking at ways to improve it, looking at ways to make it better. Um, and as a board, we discuss this a lot um, and have discussed this and tried to put things in place in a reasonable and sound order from the beginning. Um, and one of the things that we have looked at is not only um, private developers coming in, but developers for the village that have been coming in and will be coming in and looking at making sure that there is an affordable housing piece for every project that comes into this village. Um, and I think that that's important that we look at everything across the board and not just um, the, the village properties that are, are up or just the pieces that um, we're concerned about. Um, one of the things that we want to keep on the forefront is that affordable housing is an issue throughout Westchester and New York State, and we're trying to be front runners in that and not behind the eight ball all the time. Um, again, we are very, very concerned about affordable housing. Um, it is first and foremost, to me, a very important, pro um, important piece of this government, and I think that we are continuing to take a firm hard stand on um, looking to keep that as a part of our government. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Barisi. Well, I'm going to be probably like a skunk in a lawn party. I don't know how we can have any more affordable housing in Austin. Um, we need senior housing more than affordable housing. I don't know what the difference would be, but we certainly want to keep our seniors in town. Um, Affordable housing means if we get a developer in here that's going to build something, we're going to demand him to have so many affordable units. What do we have to give him to get that? If we have to give him tax abatements, that means the commercial properties and the people that own their own homes right now will be taxed more. The problem really isn't, isn't affordable housing. We need affordable taxes. You can afford a house in this town. You can't afford the taxes in this, in this town. And it's not this village that's the tax problem. It's the school. It's the school board that's spending our money. If you really want to cut back on taxes, you should be all at the school board meeting, not at a village board meeting, beating up on all the politicians that are there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we must take questions from the floor. Let me give you just the outline of how we'll do this. Uh, speaker, please come to the microphone in the center of the room. State your name and address uh, and indicate to whom your question is addressed, although each candidate will have an opportunity to respond if they wish. Uh, we ask that you not come for a second or third question until everyone has had an opportunity to ask the first question. Your question must be brief, 30 seconds or less. No personal agendas, please. They will be ruled out of order. Uh, any questions of a personal nature will not be allowed and will be ruled out of order. And I have the right to rule out those issues. Uh, we do encourage you to, to, to try to cover this. Uh, there will be a one and a half minute response time from the candidates. First question, please. Um, I'd like to ask a question. Um, um, well, my name is uh, Dr. Ferradinas, um, and I live in the second Ferris place in Austin, New York. My name is. Um, I have a question for uh, Trustees uh, Borgia and uh, Cheatham. Uh, specifically, <coughs> what exactly do you intend to do to keep uh, rents from rising in the village of Boston? Yeah. 
You know, I think we're very concerned with um, protection of tenants in addition to um, their rents, but also to make sure that they're being treated fairly in every part of their relationship with their landlord. So um, one of the things that we have done is to create or to reconstitute, I should say, the tenant landlord um, relations board. And one of the things that they are able to do is to help mediate when there is a situation where the rents have escalated very high, to help mediate between the landlord and the tenant. I think that um, another thing that we did actually the what when we were elected the, the outgoing board actually stopped their plans to close down Austin's section 8 office um, which protects residents who have section 8 from having to go to white plains in order to conduct their uh, their business to keep their section 8 vouchers I think that um, one of Things that a village board does to keep rents down is to keep the taxes that we charge to landlords down and we've been very um, careful to make sure that our spending is is done in an appropriate way and then in order to pass that along to tenants and then I guess the the next thing that you that we can do is to make sure that all of the housing in the village of Austin is safe is has um, is uh, not a violation of any health or human safety code that we have in the village. Uh, I would just like to, to add to that is I'm, I'm one of the board liaisons to the Landlord Tenant Council and um, we work diligently with not only the landlords but the um, tenants. Um, when issues arise we you know are able to work on um, more than just rent issues because tenants have um, issues that are far greater and broader than just their rent going up, and I think that we need to be mindful that um, we, you know, that that's a broader scope than that. Um, and again, you know, I work closely with the Section 8 office um, to ensure that you know people or their vouchers are are um, you know that there when there are issues that you know someone is there with them that we can talk about it. We can look at ways and avenues to help people with rent situations. We are always available for that. Um, and you know, again, I know this this question is is trying to go around circles about adopting the ETPA, and um, and I'm not going to say fully one way or the other. Um, and I think that's a question that each of us has to answer individually. Anyone else want to respond? Um, yes, I do. Um, as I said in my opening statement, I believe in the immediate enactment of the Emergency Tenants Protection Act or rent control. There are people in this village who are paying over $1,400 a month for a one bedroom apartment. We are so behind in enacting this legislation. Austin is one of the only areas in Westchester County a working class area that does not have ETPA. There are 20 communities who have adopted it, including Croton, Harrison, Hastings, and Irvington. None of these areas are going downhill. They are managing to protect their tenants and their residents from paying exorbitant rents. I believe Osney is so far behind everyone else in the enactment of this legislation. We don't need to talk about what we're doing and tenant and landlord relations board. We need action and the people who are living here need action because pretty soon we will be losing the working class character of this village and we will be losing more and more of our residents to other areas. Uh, I'd just like to add uh, two points to what Marie Gelli already said. I also strongly support the enactment of the Emergency Tenants Protection Act to help protect uh, tenants from, from rent increases. And I want to point out, there's a school thought that I've heard, and I think we've probably all heard it, that you get rent control, that means the landlords can't make a profit, next thing you know they're walking away from the buildings and the city turns into a slum, okay? That's a school of thought. That is not by any means necessarily correct, it depends on Situation, and I would repeat what Ms. Galliardi said. Dobbs Ferry, I think, is one that she forgot to mention. Oh, it's on the list there. Uh, there. There are municipalities in Westchester that are doing just fine, that are not going down. No, that have the Emergency Tenants Protection Act. There's a process where the, the rent increases are debated and, and input is sought, 
and uh, landlords obviously have to get a fair return on their investment. You don't want to destroy it. But tenants can be protected at the same time, and the village government can play a role in that. And I'm optimistic, as far as that's concerned, that there is a role for the village government to play, and I think we should play that role. And I think uh, as far as people being afforded not being able, I don't know, my, uh, my children, we're in the same situation. Uh, our daughter had uh, moved to Peekskill, was renting in Austin, eventually moved to Peekskill, now lives in Croton. Croton has the Emergency Tenant Protection Act. I wonder if that's why in the large complex that she lives in, the rent hasn't skyrocketed out of sight and a young person can afford to live there. I think there's a strong possibility. I'd like to see that for Austin. Um, yeah, I uh, I don't know if anybody on this board owns any buildings, but I certainly do. And uh, we're not trying to make a profit. We're just trying to pay our bills. Believe me, the rent goes up because the taxes go up. I think Sandy Gaylock hit it on the head. We have to turn around and somehow get the school taxes out of our village and somehow statewide in order for us to have affordable housing. Thank you. Um, at this time, so many people with questions. I'm going to shorten the response time to one minute to go out for more questions. Next question, please. <coughs> I'm Miguel Hernandez. Uh, I'm the mayor of the village of Austin, and I live at 10 North Water Street. I'd like to ask uh, all of the uh, candidates above for, uh, that are running for a uh, trustee position, how, what their vision is of the village and what they would do uh, to improve the village uh, for the next uh, several years and how they would work if they were to be a minority on the board, how would they work collegially with the majority board. You, you would like a response from all of them? From all of them, yes. Uh, let's go backwards. Um, I, it would be difficult. Um, I think that we'd all have to work together. I know, Miguel, I, I worked with you before on uh, on this. And um, what's my vision? I think we're, we got to get some buildings in the village where the parking lots are. we got to build a parking structure. I know, Miguel, you didn't. You weren't in favor of the parking structure, but that certainly would help the village of Ossing. All those lots that are all over the village could be buildings with housing above it and stores below it. That's what I think what we would have to do in the village. Um, my vision of the village. It's a, it's a village. First of all, it's not a city. It's not a rural area. It's a village. It has a kind of an urbanish downtown. It's river town. Um, I see similar as far as downtown is concerned to what Mr. Creasy just said, that, that, that you want to have commercial, you want to have re uh, uh, recreation, you want to have cultural activities in the downtown, it's the heart of the village, and you want to have some residents above it, and you want to have a good mix, the right mix, not every mixed use is good, is, is good. It's, not a, it's not a mantra, it's not magic words, you want the right mix, you want it in the right place. Uh, as how to work with people, I, I have no problem with working people that I uh, working with people that I have differences of opinion with. I can reach consensus. Obviously, there's a there's a difference between working together on a board and some people being on a board and some people being in the audience. It's a different scenario there. I have no problem working with people with differences of opinion, and I would see if I was in the minority on the board that I would indeed, however, continue to voice my opinion, and so that I think it's important for different opinions to be heard, even on a board. Um, <clears throat> the village of Austin I would like to see is similar to what it was when I first moved here before what 9A was widened. We had lots of commercial activity going on in the village. We had stores, we had restaurants, and there were people living above the stores. I think that this mix was a good mix, and I think this is what we should aim for. Um, I believe that what we should do is assess what's available in the downtown. My first step would be to um, do something with the vacant bank building that's on the corner of Spring and Main. I think it would be an excellent impetus if we could do something with that building, something cultural and having retail shops there that would start to bring people back into the downtown because there would be something there for, their, for them to go to. Um, I think there are many creative ideas in revitalizing a downtown. 
but I saw the arsoning downtown, and that's the kind of downtown I would like to see again. I think that we need to continue to go in the direction that we're looking at um, right now currently with the board, which is to to start to um, to look at um, bringing the, the burnt out area um, back up to speed to get that developed, to um, look at um, cleaning up some of the areas downtown, um, getting some of the buildings fixed up. And we're already going in that direction. I think that that's a direction that we're going to continue to push in, and I think that's a good way to go. Um, as a minority on the board already. Um, <laughs> it, it's easy to say that um, um, it's, um, it's, it's an easy way to look at the fact that there are five of us and, and not all the time we agree. It's like living with your family. Um, you know, we have agreed to disagree and I think that that's a good way to go about it. We will continue to do that. But we have learned to, to talk with each other and work out our issues and come to a consensus. And I think that with any um, group or board that that's what you strive to do. Um, this is a really good example of why I love the Village of Ireland because we have people here on this day who are different political parties, different philosophies of how to govern, but yet everyone really wants the same thing for the village, and that is for it to be a thriving place where many different types of people can succeed, can excel, where there's activity in our, in our main streets, where there are things for people to do and where people have the opportunity to come together and and uh, relate to each other. I think that Austin's greatest strengths are when we see our big events like the recently held um, arts festival or our fireworks day when we see people come all together. Um, I feel that frequently that I'm a minority on the board as well. I think that in, in our current situation we have people with very strong opinions on the board. We might all be um, registered Democrats. Well actually probably you're not a a Democrat, but uh, we uh, we we are are very able to come together to come to consensus, and that's the the background that I come from from volunteer organizations. Where hearing voices, all the voices of your constituency, are very important. Thank you. Next question, please. Hello, Martha Massidi, 63 Watson Avenue. I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about the professional management of the Village of Austin and what. Uh, each of you sees as your own philosophy of management and how that has impacted the professional management or will impact the professional management of the village. All right, um, Ms. Scaliardi, since you're in the middle, how did you start? <coughs> um, <coughs> years ago, we did not have a village manager type government, and we do um, today. And I believe that that should continue. Uh, I think that people who serve on the board um, have other jobs and other things to do, and I believe the village board should set the policy. But I do think the running of the everyday activity of the village should be in the hands of the village manager. I think it's very, very important to have a good village manager who is creative and can reach out and who can manage every department there is. I think there should be, we should look at the financial department because I'm a little bit concerned about the finances in Austin. I believe that uh, we need more professionalism in the finance department. Uh, Mr. Parisi, would you like to go next? Um, management, uh, we were on the board uh, for two years and I think some of the management um, has to come from the board members. Uh, I think that uh, you micromanaging, it works, believe me. When you insist on the department heads doing their jobs, then they know where it's coming from. It's coming from the board, not just the village manager. Um, I, sometimes the village manager is, they're very busy. Sometimes they can't get to the department heads. They're busy doing whatever they do in their office. And, uh, but I think that sometimes the village board has to be part of the management. Uh, Mr. Craig, go ahead. Oh, uh, just very briefly, um, <clears throat> I, I wouldn't want to do what, uh, what would be called micromanaging, but uh, I do think that it's important for the board, in, in addition to just setting the board policies, to also keep an eye on what's going on. And I think that it's important to have trustees who have the capability 
of looking at what's going on in, 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 in fields that are not necessarily their own field because not everybody can be an expert in every field, and I'm certainly not. But I think I have a good capability of getting a handle on what's going on in different fields to make sure that it really is in accordance with our policy and, and there's not some smoking type of thing going on. Um, I, I think that's important. Don't This um, village does have a village manager form of government and the um, department heads do report directly to the village manager. But as a board, we work directly not only with the department heads, but the village manager and the um, employees of the village. Um, we're open to, to work with them, but we don't you know, micromanage them. Um, I think it's important that we all work together and that we have open communication um, across the board. And I think that that's a, a great way of, of being able to keep up with what's going on, but also have um, to watch government um, work at its best. So from a management background for um, almost all of my career, besides the first three years, I was in, I've been in a management position where I have managed other employees. Um, one of the things that I am the most proud of, of our two years on the board, is the way we've been able to change the culture of the Village of Osling employees. I think we have put into place managers who have very creative, very forward-thinking ideas. They are the experts, but they're very willing to share their expertise with us on the village board. We have a village manager form of government, as Marlene has said, and that means that um, the board should not be involved in day-to-day decision-making, but should give direction and support to the good um, suggestions of the, of the managers within our village. I think that um, when you empower people, you give them the ability to work at their best and their most creative, and that's my philosophy of management. Thank you. Next question, please. Dana Lepp, Dana Lepp for 18 and Moulton Place. Um, I have a kind of a two-part question. I was, would just like if each candidate could tell me their feeling about a building moratorium in Austin. And for those um, who said that they would pass a moratorium on luxury condos until a new path master plan is finished, I just want to know how um, you would withstand any legal challenge from property owners and developers, and how you would induce developers to build only affordable housing. Um, Thank you. Uh, Ms. Porter, would you begin this time, please? Sure. sure. Um, I am one of the board liaisons to the Comprehensive Plan Committee, and I think that um, one of the things when we do very careful, thoughtful planning for the whole village, one of the things that has been suggested is that we might um, have a moratorium at some point. Yeah. I think a moratorium is a tool that a community has, and it sometimes is useful. For example, I would say that once the Comprehensive Plan Committee goes through its research phase and is very close to adopting zoning changes, that might be a good time to have a short moratorium. Um, however, I think that one of the problems in Austin, as has been stated by several of the other candidates, is that we've had um, empty buildings, I call them missing teeth, in our downtown for, for as, as long as I've lived here. I, we have had a... Um, my, I was pregnant with my oldest child when we had a fire that took off the building that we call now the We Can Do It lot. And now she's in middle school. So I think we need to have some building happening here in the village, the right building, careful building, building that brings vitality to our community. We'll just go down. Um, again, you know, a moratorium, and, and we have a comprehensive plan committee already in place. And I think that, you know, we look at where in the process you actually do that. And I think that, you know, we look, one of the things that, that I'd like to stand on, the fact that we put this committee in place, um, and I think at the point when they're ready, they will say, now is the time to do the moratorium. Um, to just do it, because we think it's, you know, the time right now may not be the exact time for the committee and or this village. Um, again, do have missing teeth in our downtown, and I think we'd like to see them filled in. I think we'd like to see some development go up um, that would, and, you know, make the downtown, as Ms. Gagliardi said, you know, retail and housing and some of the pieces that we'd like to put back into place. So this may not be the, the time to do that, um, depending on where we are on the process. <clears throat> um, first of all, if you put a moratorium, 
am in favor of a moratorium on luxury housing uh, until the completion of the master plan. But if you do it right, you will not get sued. New York State puts out a booklet which explains all the legality of a moratorium. Uh, moratoriums can have exemptions. It can have exemptions for commercial development, small residences, uh, an improvement to your home, a new porch, and also you can exclude affordable housing. So the morator moratorium is not an evil word. It has been used by other Westchester communities. I think it's time for Osney that has been so overdeveloped to sit back and take a look at what we have, where we're going, and have a moratorium. I do not think that it will harm us at all. In fact, we may have a better village because of it. Uh, I echo what Miguel already says. I am in favor of a moratorium. It's not something, and I've certainly never proposed it, and I've never heard anybody propose it. Uh, it's not something to stop development. It's not something to stop building. It's not something to keep an empty lot in the downtown as an empty lot for X number of months or years. It's something to prevent development of a kind that we have too much of or don't want it in that place. Um, and and, and I'm a, a little disturbed by the idea that just because there are those empty teeth, so to speak, in the downtown, that uh, nothing would be considered uh, possibly out of bounds there. Would, uh, if, you know, 100 feet high or 80 feet high was okay right at the waterfront? Uh, is, is something 100 feet high going to be proposed in the downtown? And then somebody's going to say that's better than nothing? I'd rather have a moratorium that would prevent so that type of thing. If it's carefully drafted, as Marie says, there is literature on how to do it so that it doesn't get out of hand and so that it will withstand legal challenges. And I want to emphasize again, it's not to stop all development. It's not to stop all building. It's just to direct it while the planning is finished. I think what I just heard from everyone over here is that, uh, yeah, they would want a moratorium as long as it isn't affordable housing. They, if affordable housing comes in, they're going to give them that housing. Everything else is a moratorium. I just don't get it. Okay. Next question, please. Good evening. John Carrillo, 72 Havel Street, the village of Osme. My question is to Catherine Gorger of Arlene Cheatham. As a person that has uh, studied the Austin Village zoning ordinance for over three decades, the words that you choose to use tonight are historic downtown, master plan, and all of the things that our community is about. My question is, I opposed when the United States government put our United States Post Office, the architectural style, in the center of our downtown. How did you allow, with no building permit, no planning board approval, none of the necessary approvals, to allow 95 Main Street across from the post office to be built, and then send the developer to get the necessary permits? It's Thank a little you. bit confusing for Thank me. you. Your time is up. Long ago. Uh, I think you could ask the question of you, Ms. Chief. Both of them. Okay, sorry. Well, they'll all get an opportunity to Well, it's to the sitting board. The other people have nothing to do with this question. Well, what happened at 95 Main Street, actually, um, to borrow a phrase from you, Mr. Perlo, goes back in time. We, unfortunately, the, the developer were, was given a, a building uh, permit to, cr to construct that, that building. One of the things that we have done in beefing up the staff and um, the, uh, by hiring a village planner in the village of Osning is to look at the procedure by which building permits and planning and zoning um, procedures happen. And we've worked very carefully with our planning and zoning board to that situations that pre-existed like that would happen again. So um, we feel that at the time, we did feel that it was important to make it right, and that's the action that we took. But we use this as a cautionary tale to make sure that our planning and zoning um, rules and regulations are followed. And I think our planning and zoning board's input has been very helpful with respect to that. Um, as she stated, this this does go back in time and before our time on the board. Um, and again, you know, we are working working with the developer, working with the planning and zoning board to ensure that the development, um, which is in um, a mid stage, is completed, that it doesn't look um, like empty 
cardboard boxes um, stacked on top of each other in the middle of 95 Main Street. Um, we do want housing there. We want people to be able to live there and have a thriving um, retail stores and businesses there. So in order to not stop the development, um, but to have it go forward so that we have, um, you know, the, that it um, is completed and that it does not look like um, cardboard boxes stop, start stocked on top of each other. Um, I'm going to add to that. Um, it's not only 95 Church Street, I mean 95 Main Street that we have a problem with, but it, in Austin we have had haphazard planning, haphazard construction. Just look at Hunter James Street. There is a mudslide waiting to happen. Uh, the builder got approvals to put something there, went in, denuded the whole pro the property. If you drive down Hunter Street and take a look at it, it's like in a state of deterioration because everything is falling apart. People who live in the area will be experiencing mudslide. I believe this board is responsible for a lot of haphazard construction that, is, that has been going on here. Anyone else? Just very briefly, I'd like to suggest that with regard to something like Hunter James that uh, that it should be considered and I'd be delighted to if I'm on the board but if I'm not anybody else can consider the idea of revisiting some of the requirements for, for permits and whatnot so that if you're talking about a situation where there's a possibility that if work doesn't proceed past a certain point you've got some kind of critical environmental situation waiting to happen like a mudslide as we're already saying and maybe want, we want to look at the possibility of putting into our, our codes some kind of requirement for a completion bond addressing some types of issues. Certainly it'd be nice to have it addressing. I wish we had it addressing that issue now, don't we? Uh, because then we would know that, that, that the thing could be completed and that somebody running out of money in midstream doesn't mean there's going to be a mudslide. Yeah, um, 95 Main Street, I think um, also the height it's way over the height limit for the elevator shaft. I, I don't know if you've, you've looked into that. But uh, I know that uh, when Capelli was building, everyone was complaining how high it is. But there's a building there that's way with the, over the height limit. Thank you. Next question, please. Good evening, Molly. The Rodriguez, 129 Croton Avenue, Village of Austin. It has been proven that safety helmets saves lives. Governments mandate bicyclists to wear helmets, construction workers, etc. My son John Paul fell off the Austin garbage truck, hit his head on the curb, and died. I believe our sanitation workers must wear safety helmets. What is your position on this safety issue? Each one, anyone, all of you. Thank you. Sorry, this is this time. Well. It's, it's pretty hard to, um, I, I understand it was a very serious accident and I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, I guess Con Ed wears them all, on, on every job they go on. Every con construction site I've ever been on, you wear them. I mean, I don't, you go to the library, go over to the, the new pool building right outside. Every, every person has a helmet on, I don't know. I don't know what, I guess it would be... Okay, useful for the village. I, don't, I really don't know it. I'd have to look into it more. I haven't followed it much at all. I know they've had meetings on it. Uh, I think, you know, our, our awareness of these kinds of issues changes as time goes on. Uh, when I was growing up, nobody wore a helmet when you rode a bicycle. Uh, and, and by the time my kids started riding bicycles, apparently they had to have helmets on. And, uh, and never having worn a bicycle helmet, I was pleased that I didn't have to. And then I got to the point where, all right, I'm supposed to wear a helmet. It is safer. I'll wear a helmet. Uh, I think that our awareness has come to the point now uh, regarding safety that sanitation workers probably should be mandated to wear helmets. And I think that the board that is sitting now could have acted a lot faster. I think they should have acted a lot faster. I think it was a little bit crazy that they pointed to this possibility, uh, uh, the, the, the litigation scenario, as to why they could not act faster. Because uh, as far as what I've been educated to, to about the law and what I've heard about the law, the board could have acted. I, I don't understand why they're not 
wearing helmets right now. I am a mother, I have two children, and if anything happened to my child, I would be dev my children, I would be devastated. Um, I don't know how this mother has kept a cool this long. I see no problem with wearing uh, a helmet. I think it's a safety necessity. Uh, please make wear a uh, bulletproof vest. Uh, we put on seat belts when we get in the car. I know when that first was enacted, a lot of people were upset about it. But I do not understand why our sanitation workers still are not wearing helmets. It seems like a no-brainer. One of the things that this board has been diligently working on um, is working with the industry, working with um, looking at helmet companies, talking to the um, manufacturers of helmets to come up with the right helmet for this type of position. Um, it, it is not an easy task, and we are trying to, you know, fulfill that 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 piece of the puzzle that's missing, but with the proper tools that is needed, and not just to go out there and pick a helmet, any helmet, put it on them, and say wear this because it may not be the right one. And we just want to make sure that before we do anything, that we do the right thing for our village employees. <laughs> Um, I think that uh, Mr. Kern and uh, Ms. Cheatham both make excellent points, and that is to say that standards change. So um, one of the problems that, first of all, let me say, Mrs. Rodriguez, how sorry I am for, for the loss of your son. You, you know you and I have had many conversations about this. But um, the problem is that standards do change. One of the things that, when this first happened, was my immediate mother instinct to say, you know, get helmets on these guys tomorrow. The problem with that is that when we did some research, we really Realize that there, so far in this industry, there is no standard helmet that is made for the work that sanitation workers do. So I think that what we are trying to do is is trailblaze, and we have actually done some research and done some work with some helmet companies that might be able to find the right tool. You wouldn't have your, you wouldn't feel good if your child was wearing a bicycle helmet when they were riding a motorcycle. You need the right helmet to protect people. The wrong helmet could actually do more harm than good, and I, and I certainly don't want to be responsible for placing our workers in danger. Thank you, and we have time for one final question, please. Mr. Parisi uh, brought up the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, my name's Kathy Balabet. I live at One Lake Way, Austin. Um, Mr. Parisi brought up uh, the school budget as one of the tax property problems and also talked, was the first to talk about party um, by whom he is uh, chosen to run. Um, my understanding is that the tax policy is because the, the Republicans have lowered the income tax amount so that our property taxes continue to go up. Um, you will obviously support the landlords, which is a uh, you know, part of the Republican Party as far as I know. Um, I am wondering, really this is a question for uh, the incumbents and for uh, Marie, Maria Gaffaliardi and Steve Kern, as well as for Mr. Parisi, why did you choose to run under the parties that um, have you on their slate? and what are your ideals in that okay. well, well, I'm a lifelong Democrat, um, so it was clear that I would join the Democratic Party wherever I lived and, and would work as, as a Democrat. I think, though, for local election, uh, and I believe very strongly in, in uh, the Democratic ideals of fairness and of um, making sure that everyone has the same rights regardless of your wealth your status in the society. But I think for local elections, actually, I don't know that it matters that much. I think for local elections, you should vote for the person who you think will do the best job. And um, I certainly encourage everyone to vote and to do that, to evaluate where we stand on things and to see where, you know, where accomplishments have happened, where, where people have the skills and the drive and the commitment and the, and the de dedication to do a good job and to vote for the people that they think will best represent them. Because of course, that's what a representative democracy is. You, you vote for someone who makes decisions on your behalf, and that's what our village board does. I, keep, I think the key to every election is to vote for the best candidate, um, not the best party, not the worst party, not the independent or the
the middle party, but the best candidate. And I think if we keep that in the forefront, um, when you go in to vote on November 7th, that um, everything else will fall into place. Um, I am a lifelong Democrat, having cast my first vote for John Kennedy for president. Um, I am running on the Working Families Party line because I disagree with the policies of the current Democrat board. Um, I was a, a member of the Democratic Committee for many years, uh, until probably the late 1990s. Um, I wish we could agree on policy, but we just don't. And at one time, the local Democratic Party had members, they invited everybody in. Everybody had different opinions, but now, unfortunately, the party speaks with one voice. Uh, I agree with the point that's been made that, that uh, at the local level, um, party politics are not necessarily as important as they can be in, at the national level or uh, even at the state level perhaps. With that said, it, it so happens I am a lifelong Democrat also. Uh, I uh, would have been happy to run on a Democratic line. We had a little primary. It didn't go the way I was looking for. So I'm not running on the Democratic line. Uh, I'm very happy also, however, to be on the Working Families Party line uh, on, on some issues that are not necessarily village issues, uh, it also reflects many of my values as far as the problems of working people. I think it just so happens in this election, this year, there are some issues that resonate there involving, for example, uh, tenant protection and affordable housing. These are concerns of working families across the state of New York, and these are concerns of working families here in New York State, and I'm very much in tune with those kinds of concerns. Yeah, I think we all know the numbers that um, the Democrats certainly outnumber the Republicans. Um, that's why if you even look up here at the, the board, we couldn't get another person to run uh, on the Republican <coughs> Party, and that's very sad in our bill, that our Republican Party is now almost out of business. Um, I think that the election should go into March rather than in, in November when you, at, this year is going to be tough. Because everyone's going to come out and vote because you've got the governor this year. Uh, so you're going to get all the people who are not interested in the village that are living in our condos come out and pull levers. They're going to pull Democrats. Thank you. That's now close our uh, question and answer session for the audience. We'll now move to closing statements from each candidate, and we will go uh, according to drawing of lots. Uh, and Ms. Gagliardi goes first in closing statement of one and a half minutes. I have lived in Austin my entire adult life. I cast my first vote in Austin when I turned then legal age 21. My children grew up in Austin and were educated in the Austin public schools. Unfortunately, my children cannot afford to live in Austin and I drive seven hours each way to visit them and my grandchildren. Austin is not moving forward. It was a forward-moving place before the widening of Route 9 and urban removal. Development, as Austin has known it, has not improved its downtown. The construction of luxury housing is not the solution. Development, commercial, cultural, recreational, and residential in the right mix, in the right place, and in the right size is what will move Austin's downtown forward. I want to go again to a downtown where people mix and on a Thursday evening when stores stay open late, greet my neighbors. I want Austin to remain the diverse village it always was. I do not want to see the working class, the young people, and retired older citizens moving away because they cannot afford to live here. Regardless <coughs> of what the incumbents say, Austin is not moving forward. It is stuck in traffic. If elected, our team, Don D. Barr, Steve Kern, and myself will work hard to bring life back to Main Street and make it once again the heart of our community. Mr. Kern. Uh, I thank the League for this forum again. I wanted to say that. And I want to remind everybody uh, 
that there are some real issues in this election. This is not just a popularity contest. This is not just about, you know, we should feel good about ourselves or feel good about our village. We should, because Ossining has a lot of strengths, but that's not all it's about. Um, I think that there's a, there's a need for some change here in Ossining. Uh, I think that we need different people on the board. I think we need different ideas on the board. I think that I and Marie Galliardi and Don DeBoer are certainly different people and have some of those different ideas, and we have been voicing them, and I would like to have a chance to try them out. Um, there's a lot of things that get said from candidates that sounds the same, um, but I would ask people to look for whether there's a commitment and look at what the track record is with regard to some of these issues, because some of these issues, like affordable housing, like development of the downtown, are not brand new issues. They've been here for a while, while uh, a, a certain threat of, of people have been controlling the village government, so this is nothing new. Um, Marie, Don, and I will do what needs to be done. We won't just talk about it. We're not reluctantly uh, proposing things. We're committed to things like addressing the housing issues, skyrocketing rents, uh, Emergency Tenants Protection Act, downtown revival, having the same uh, planning. And so I would ask people to look for us on Roll E, where we happen to be running on the Working Families Party, and, and please give us your support then. Thank you. Thank you. I again would like to thank the League of Women Voters for having this opportunity. Um, and I want to again stress the, the um, wonderful fact that this board is trying it's with all diligence to keep Austin moving forward. Um, we want to, to continue to see downtown revitalized. We want to see the waterfront um, project completed. We want to see um, some of the issues and concerns that the village residents have brought up um, finished and brought to an end. Um, and in order to do that, we'd like to be able to con to to stay and, and work one more term or work the term to, to have some of the ideas and things that we have been doing come and be completed. Um, it's difficult in two years to start a project and, and get to the middle of it and want to see it end. And we'd really like to be able to watch and go through the process. Um, again, Rome wasn't built in a day, and Austin will not be built in an hour, but we're trying very diligently to make sure that everything is done. Um, we want to continue with the economic revitalization, our waterfront development, our planning, our housing, and everything that we have started. Um, we've done, you know, and again, we ask that when you go out to vote on November 7th, that you vote for William Hanauer, Susan Donnelly, Catherine Borgia, and myself. Thank you, and, and have a really good night. That would be Mr. Parisi. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. <too. laughs> okay, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for having us here. And, um, you know, I'll be very short as, as usually I am. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone gets out and votes November 7th. It's very important to vote. It's your privilege and your honor to vote. Um, no matter who you vote for, you got to come out and cast a vote. Thank you very much. And this is gorgeous. I want to also echo the thanks to the League of Women Voters. Also, thank you to Go TV because although we have quite a nice audience here tonight, uh, not everyone is able to come out to see the debates live, and it's really wonderful to be able to have people have an opportunity to hear the candidates and hear their ideas. So thank you very much. Um, I feel very proud of the board that I sit on. I think that my colleagues, uh, Bill Hanauer, Susan Donnelly, Marlene Cheatham, and myself have really worked very hard together to solve issues that have been long outstanding in the village of Austin. I think we're seeing progress on projects that have stalled for, for many years, and not, not because of a lack of will or a lack of you know, good heartedness by people who serve, but because of real problems, and I, I feel that our ability to accomplish as much as we have in the past two years. We're coming up to completion of this building, which will be a very vital community center. We have um, signed the Harbor Square deal, which will be another marvelous place that will allow our residents to access the waterfront for recreational uses. And um, our, our comprehensive plan committee and the survey work that they have done, and actually our comprehensive plan committee survey suggests that one of the things that make Austin special for many of the residents who live here is having access to the waterfront. So I think that we've done an excellent job at listening to constituents 
experience, and we certainly want the input of many, many people in the village of Austin, and thank you for providing the input. I'm asking that you vote for, for me and for my colleagues, so let's keep uh, the progress going. I think that during campaigning, we've really found a lot of optimism, and I think that that's a very encouraging sign. All right, I want to thank all of the candidates.
have had my hands in redevelopment projects from Poughkeepsie, New York City, and have seen communities change over the last 35 years, where things have been successful, where they failed, pretty good handle on who knows how to do what. Um, and so I think those are skills that uh, would be useful for the board. Um, if I'm elected with Steve, who is a union attorney, um, and Marie, who has her background in municipal financial planning and uh, municipal finance, I think we can really have some of the things happen that people have been promising for the last 30 years happen in the next two. Thank you. And Mr. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody uh, for their well wishes. A week ago, I had emergency surgery. And if I sound a little bit low key, it's because they have to be stapled together. So please, uh, it's important for me to be here this evening because the campaign has been going on for six months. I want to thank the uh, League of Women Voters and all the people participating in this process uh, for allowing tonight to give ideas. Um, one of the reasons I feel strongly about elections, especially elected seats, is because elected seats should not be appointed or appointed to any individual. They have to earn that seat. And I think it's important that we provide a necessary balance to each government. I think we can all agree in this room that having one government on the federal level just does not work. We need to break it up. We need that idea. We need that exchange. And that's why I'm in this race. I think it's important that when people talk about going door to door, about having a majority board, how do you feel you will not have a majority board? My outlook is very different now about having a majority board. The majority board to me now is working with people that share the same idea as any, one, any five of us, any one of us on the five member board. So in other words, if my colleague is an opposition opposing party and he has an idea, and I think it moves the village of Austin forward, well, I'm going to be part of that majority board, and I hope vice versa. So we need to really put the politics away. I share Catherine Board and Marlene Schiff's thoughts about it really doesn't make a hoot. It doesn't really make a hoot on a local level. It's the people that can get the job done. I think my tenure has proven for the past two uh, terms I was in office, we have done. My resume speaks for itself. It's on that counter. I've been elected three times. I've been fortunate to be elected three times. Thank you. All right. We now have a question for and it happens to be the same one as trustees. Elected, what initiatives could you implement to increase Austin's affordable housing, especially for its workforce residents? And let's start with you, Mr. Brill. We've done a lot of things for the two years that I was in office. I can actually say that I'm a product of what we call affordable housing today. 20 years of my life, I lived at 74 Broadway. It's a six-family cold water flat. We didn't call it affordable housing there because that term wasn't used at that time. But I had a plan that I delivered to this community, and the board that sits here heard it two years ago about affordable housing. My plan is different. Their plan is just keep talking talking and talking about it. But the village of Austin has about five acres of a bin property on top of Snow and U Playground. I had it all cleaned up through the volunteer effort of the General Electric Corporation. Eighty employees came down as a team and took out tractor trailers of debris. We made a good visual site. As many of you know, I developed. And there is a place that we could put it at least 100 to 110 units of affordable housing. But I think that affordable housing can be for the entire community by offering to people at home two, three, four family homes with tax incentives. It's a hard thing to do, but we need to start. Every year, this community hears the same political rhetoric, whether it's Republican, Democrat, whoever it may be. It's time now to get serious about if this is the direction that we need to go. Affordable housing can be done with a shovel in the ground. We need to know how to manage such a, uh, a task. And I ask for your support because I can deliver that. I will be the mayor along working with whoever on the board will put the shovel in the ground for affordable housing. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thank you. Um, I think we'll wait until the election is. <laughs> but, um, 
my uh, first is when you look at the uh, housing condition, uh, the housing market, it was lost or anywhere. Um, there's a cloth, um, a number of things that are uh, dependent upon each other uh, that have to be considered. Immediately, the first thing that I would do is to uh, establish a housing policy that, uh, number one, uh, was founded on a finding by the board that there was a housing emergency. Um, and following from that, we would have the uh, rent control statute, the ETPA. Uh, but having found that the housing emergency to create or use an existing uh, vehicle uh, to uh, you know, own and work and work contract with others to own and or affordable housing. And then we over to uh, Starr Associates and turn into the others who have large projects in the community now were years ago and say, looking at this entire thing as a whole, and we're looking at the basically the obscene profit we're doing on the back of the tenant population in our community, is certainly sufficient public policy for us to take your project by the If you're not going to deal with the needs of our tenants, we're going to start with that. What do you have to say? With the Emergency Tenant Protection Act in place, children uh, rent from them this way, we are the rest of the county is going this way, and with uh, owners of the projects knowing that, or actually taking projects to operate the municipally, we can definitely do a lot immediately about affordable housing or getting it back. Thank you, Mr. Hanau. Eminent domain, I'm really shocked on what made you complain viciously about eminent domain being used down by the waterfront for any purpose whatsoever. Uh, affordable housing policy has been the, the policy and the work of the board ever since I've been on it, the three months prior to my being on it. We in place and we are developing it further. Uh, there will be a 10% set aside for all new construction and reconstruction in the village. Um, and if there is proven hardship by a, a developer, they must either build those 10% apartments on another piece of property, and I want to in the law that says they have to build them first, or they must put into a fund $3,000 uh, for, for every studio that would have been built, 75 for every one bedroom, 125 for two bedrooms, 155 And for a new original rental uh, buildings, the formula uh, I have asked that there be a formula added to the policy that figures out the median income and backs out of that, um, from the median income, backs out of that and finds an original rent that is no more than 80% of, 30% of 80% of county minimum, or 50% or 60% depending upon what we set as the goal for that. Um, and we will tie the increases uh, that, that happens to CPI, computer, uh, Consumer Price Index. Um, well, it's my time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now will have questions from the floor. I'm here at the microphone. I will reiterate the, the rule of engagement. Uh, please give your name and address. Your questions brief. It is not a platform for a uh, you may direct your question to any of the can any candidates. All of them will have an opportunity to answer. Uh, nothing of a personal nature. Uh, I will rule out all questions. Uh, we will have a one-minute response from the candidates. First question, please. My name is Tom Wojcicki. I have three candidates. I live in Austin. Uh, it's a two-part question. Uh, number one, if elected. What do you intend to do about the sanitation department working? Uh, the hourly work is only working part time. Their hourly workers, they pay work that they work. They're not working eight hours a day, but they're being paid. The second part is, are you going to do the management, starting from the village manager on down, who is doing this? appropriation of our tax money. All right. That's the all three candidates. All right. Mr. Hanauer, please. The contract that was negotiated uh, with the union that represents the uh, sanitation 
transportation workers. The state's very clear that they uh, may work to 40 hours a week. The contract was negotiated by uh, a former mayor. That contract is something that we inherited and we have to live with until a new contract goes into effect on January 1st, 2008. We will, we will renegotiate um, during 2007 uh, the terms of that contract. And as you know, I'm, a union I'm the union side negotiator for 15 years. A negotiation is the same on both sides. You need to come to some sort of consensus at the table for a contract to work. Um, the the workers uh, in the sanitation department are on an e under an enormous amount of pressure to do very difficult and very heavy work. Um, and we are all aware of the great tragedy that happened to the Rodriguez son. Uh, he was one of the workers. And they know from his reports how difficult that work was. And we're going to, to make that work um, easier for the workers, but make it complete for the village. We have supervisors who go and sure every day that everything that needs to be done out on the street, the replacing of the cans, everything like that is done for the workers leave. Um, you know, we have uh, on our team uh, actually a union lawyer, so in terms of what the status of the contract is and how much weight we would have in, uh, in these issues, of course, we have an expert that I can lean on even without, uh, before we get to dealing with it with outside counsel. Um, you know, looking at the possibility of uh, being mayor actually in January and dealing with this, I have to be, you know, uh, judicious in the language they use, but I'm not going to be political about it. If the facts are that the sanitation workers are uh, not working according to what they're supposed to be doing, if they're being paid for doing one quantity of work and they're actually doing another, and if that is not what the agreement, the legal agreement is between us and, you know, between the village and those workers, uh, that situation will be remedied immediately, and if it turns out that that condition existed and with or without the knowledge of the manager, the manager would be disciplined as soon as possible. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, I'm glad that you know, there are a number of issues going across where, you know, I can rely on Marie uh, to deal with uh, issues of uh, finance around, you know, she's had uh, a remarkable career uh, as the control of the town and as the receiver of taxes. Yeah increased return to the community in each case tremendously. Um, and uh, Steve Kurt, who was a uh, very uh, top-notch union lawyer. Thank you. It's fortunate that people are not reading the contract that was signed that I know how to read. When the gentleman, Mr. Hanauer, says up to 40 hours, he needs to read a little bit more after 40 hours and time and a half. There is no specific contract for sanitation men. There is no specific contract for sanitation. It's a CSEA contract. And there is a management that has to be reevaluated. And it may not come from the inside. I suggested to the village board that they hire a management team to make an analysis of many departments over the last several months to come up with um, unbiased recommendations to present to the village board to implement. Garbage men work very hard. It's like any other organization. You're going to have to let go, but for the majority, I watched them for four years. They work very hard. So what I'm saying to you is their philosophy also up to 40 hours this can also be applied to the building department, to the DPW. They might as well call 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock when they feel like it too, because it's a CSEA contract. That's the part that they, under, they don't quite understand. But the efficiency expert, or the company that this village should have, would allow the politics, the personalities, and the in-house people to be removed from this. Next question, please. Clay Tiffany, host of Durs and Charlatans. According to eyewitnesses, there has been an ongoing illegal gambling operation tolerated by the Osney Police Department and the Osney government. Now, I 
Eyewitnesses have made me aware of a de facto brothel being tolerated by the Austin Police Department. In fact, at least one Austin Police Department member is well aware of this establishment, which also conducts illegal drug dealing. How do you feel about the fact that the present government and Police Chief Joe Burton have not even sat down with me regarding these Thank egregiously you. pernicious operations? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Perlow, would you please get it, please? Well, uh, Mr. Tiffany, um, it was this mayor, when I was in office, that made sure that I believe you had a meeting with the chief of police when you requested it, and so did several other people. I'm not quite sure specifically what you are alluding to because you did not mention any particular names. However, if there is a legal activity uh, within the village of Austin, then the necessary people, whoever that may be, should take a stand and do the necessary investigation to find out whether in fact or it's fiction. What I do know from being there is that gambling itself is not illegal. Every one of us in this room can put money on this table and play cards. We can do any type of gambling. It's when an individual or individual individuals from that particular uh, session. That's where it becomes illegal. As far as uh, brothels, well, that's a situation that needs to be dealt with. I have heard that now our local taxis are the service provided for drop-offs. I don't know if that's fact or is that fiction, but I can tell you it's a very important quality of life issue within the village of Austin. Things that I think that we address for two years, uh, we just ran out of time, and that's why I'm in front of this community asking for the support once again. Thank you. You know, Austin's voting code is not uh, modeled from Las Vegas' own code. <laughs> There's no provision uh, for house of prostitution. There's no provision for casinos. Um, and those things are just, they're proscribed under our voting ordinance. Uh, if that's what's happening. You know, if there is a, and, and you've been bringing this to the board for eight years or six years or something, you know, I assume that there is a way for, you know, our police department, our you know, municipal officials to do fact-finding. Is it happening or not? If it's happening, then unlike many of the other, uh, you know, issues like building an apartment building on Main Street in plain view of everyone, without any permits or, uh, you know, the, for various things that uh, have gone on historically in this community, it should be enforced. The person should be sanctioned. If they, they should be fined. There are provisions in our code for, you know, you have an illegal activity on you know, your property and you're given an opportunity, to, you know, to be told to stop and you don't stop or paying a fine. It aggregates. This is what they do everywhere in the civilized world where they enforce the land use laws. In Austin, they have open buildings with open roofs. They came in the middle of town. I don't know if we can do anything about it. I last night they're finding a guy $500. And the police sit there for six and a half, seven years in the middle of town. I know in other communities where I get calls from their lawyers, if they step that much out of line, they're looking at big fines, problems, and having the building taken. So, you know. And indeed, we have increased fines for breach of, uh, of uh, certificate frequency from 100 maximum to 5,000 maximum in the last uh, three months there have been $30,000 worth of fine levies. Um, if there is a house of prostitution in this village then we need to get to the bottom of it and if you will um, give the details that you know make sure that it, it is dealt with by the police department. Uh, in terms of gambling, if, if you have evidence that the gambling that you have seen is illegal evidence, please provide it to the police. I will speak to the chief personally and ask him to speak to you. But to continue to, to, um, uh, to allow things like, uh, like gambling and, uh, and prostitution in this village uh, to continue at all is inappropriate and it will stop. Next question, please. Good evening, gentlemen. Maldita Rodriguez, 129 Fulton Avenue, Austin. My question is the same as before. 
teaching one of you what position do you stand on in the safety office? I have been very clear about my position on safety helmets. Um, a, an inappropriate helmet um, to assign to a worker uh, is worse than no helmet at all. A helmet that gives false security is worse than no helmet at all. A helmet that would, would be written, uh, worn by a bicycle rider with a point up front and no support in the back, no help at all to someone who falls on the back. Um, it, it is very clear that the direction we have to go is to have OSHA or PESH or both set the standards and we will then buy the helmets that are created from those standards that are set. We have, as you, as you know, because you are at that meeting, we have interviewed one helmet manufacturer. We have requested other helmet manufacturers uh, to come and we will continue to do so until have found one that works, but I do not hold up any, any false hope that we will vote to have helmets on, on our employees if those helmets are not deemed to protect those employees from the very dangers that they face. I hear a theme here. Um, we can't adopt rent control until we study the problem. We can't put helmets on people until the problem. We can't have a moratorium until we study the problem. They've been studying for a very long time. Studying. April 2nd, 1975, which is before the current but uh, downtown, this is revitalizing downtown. This is 31 years ago. Um, let's see. Uh, the downtown uh, that is to arise should not be confused with the deteriorated business section that has been demolished. Uh, let's see, 1992, Main Street make a comeback. 1993, uh, Bill Burton running for office. He's going to consolidate Austin and to rebuild the downtown. I think it's 93. <laughs> no. um, helmets, not rocket science. We're not designing a uh, crash helmet for the uh, shuttle. Either they're safe or they're not. Um, I assume that that knowledge exists somewhere in the States of America in one of the communities, and it, I'm sure that the manufacturers have sufficient information that this village board could have studied it. I have a real concern, okay? This is my concern. We had someone die already. We've had their family come before the board now for a year or so, essentially saying this problem exists and this is a solution to it, and now we have people going out on trucks every day. If someone else dies and Someone can show in court that a helmet would have saved their life looking at writing a very big check and it's based on gross negligence by this board. I sit down and decide which ones to say very quickly and tell people you gotta wear it. Only the past several months I kept a low profile on this issue because I very strongly based on the seriousness of the loss of the Rodriguez family that I did not want to drag this into the political arena. My only political involvement was signing a petition in front of St. Augustine's Church. But one of the candidates said that it's a no-brainer, and it's a no-brainer. Government just like this. God forbid this situation happened again, and it happened to any one of the village board members. The trucks would be retrofitted the next day, the helmets would be on the next day, and everything would be okay. But here's my, here's my point. My point is, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. This nonsense that they talk about interviewing companies after companies and who didn't show up, get a helmet on. If we can tell our, our employees to put vest on, highlighted safety vest, and we tell them to put steel-toed shoes on, what is the difference of telling them to put a helmet? It's all part of that safety program. But this board is just spinning their wheels, trying to get through another election, just as usual, and here we go. I want to know how they're going to brush their teeth in the mirror, look at themselves, if another garbage employee falls off a truck and dies tomorrow. You tell me. Caruso, 
138 L.A. Sausalene. Metal sanitation pail is in the middle of the road right now. Can't hear it now. My sanitation pail is in the middle of the road right now on Walden Road. My questions have always pertained to finances. Paying 13 sanitation workers $50,000 this year, and I've clocked them and I've seen them go home at 1047. That's less than half a day. That means if they're going home half a day, we are losing as taxpayers from our from our funds, public funds, you're missing away $425,000 of public funds. This is theft of government funds. Tack that on to being over budget with this administration and the previous one. What will you do? Stop spending money you don't have and stop giving away money to employees who are not earning it. Thank you. Thank you for letting me go there. I think that the problem with bureaucracy, known as government, it gets so bloated that it's just business as usual. I think people in positions of uh, bureaucracy, if they ran their household the way they run their particular job, they go bankrupt. I am a person that has been in the private sector for 39 years. And I'm proud to say that I have to watch the monies that I spend. My point is this. We have a village manager level of government. That filters down to department heads, which filters down to foremans. We have all of the necessary positions in place. As mayor, I am very uh, aware of fiscal accountability. Now, people may jump up and down when they hear this because some of the things that I may have done does not fit their particular needs. But I left this village with over almost $11 million fund balance. That is dwindled down, which I will talk about later on in the closing statement. So it's about accountability, it's about people doing their job, and people should be responsible in all levels of positions. And these are all high paid level jobs. Um, you know, I think I said before, it was a similar question that we do um, immediately in a set of um, fact finding this. But if the facts are as they're presented, you know, my intention to go in and uh, destroy morale among the people that work very hard for the village. But, you know, on the other hand, you know, the people that are paying taxes here, the people that are paying rent, which is being funneled to taxes here, also, and uh, you know, we're supposed to get a fair return on our money. If it turns out that people are being paid for a, you know a job and doing half that job, uh, that situation will end very quickly. The number of ways to deal with it: one is to cut costs. I don't know if you want to have fewer people doing garbage collection and the uh, hazards that have been already by the accident that we suffered last year, um, but there are the things to do around town, perhaps, that could fill someone's day out. And um, I think that if people were looking at, uh, you know, at, at facing that situation, the uh, uh, all-American Peter principle might uh, find its way into the equation and would maybe slow down and fill up their day uh, doing their job um, instead of in four hours, in seven hours, and that might be the uh, best outcome for everybody, particularly in terms of safety. I think it's very important to remember that the workers who we're talking about here are, are working extraordinarily hard, picking up huge amounts of garbage every single day. Um, these workers are also the ones who are here for us when the snow hits the ground and we need them in an instant. They are out there clearing snow. It's the same people doing that. It's the same people who get transferred to other departments as well. I'm not excusing the concept of somebody working for, for fewer hours than is demanded of that person. But if the demand of that person is to do a specific job, perhaps if that job does not take the time, perhaps that job needs to be extended. We have met with the leadership and the union, the, le the leadership for the village and the union. Um, the, we have made it clear 
no one is to be dismissed until such time as the supervisor has checked the entire route <coughs> until the trucks are clean. Um, we have, as well, determined to buy three new trucks with, with video screen with video equipment in the back so that so that the uh, driver can actually keep track of what's happening at the back with with microphones uh, that are two-way with emergency stop buttons on both sides of the trucks with cabs for three people instead of the the one person one side and the other and the other separated by a very large hump. Um, so we have, we are make we are working to make the work more attractive and more efficient. And if we can do that, then we will be able to make the workers work the longer period. Okay, the next question, please. Good evening, Martha, the CD sixty three Watson Avenue. I'd like to ask you the same question that I asked the trustees before, Mr. Hanauer, Mr. Dugardinus. What is your management style and how will that impact the professional management of the village? And Mr. Carrillo, in the past you have said that you are a micromanager. Could you please explain how that is beneficial to the village? Thank you. This has been a very exciting in the last uh, year and a half. I am not a micromanager by any stretch of the imagination. I am someone who works in coalition and uh, in, by consent with my colleagues and with the employees. Um, I am out there on a regular basis at the water purification plant, at the sanitation uh, uh, facility, at the ride-arounds uh, on, on sanitation trucks and with the police and with, I am a member of the fire company. I recognize uh, what goes on with, with uh, fire, with the needs of the fire companies. Um, I am very clearly a person who works with the executive director, in this case with the village manager, um, to make sure that our job, which is providing maximum services at minimum cost and keeping the taxes low, to make sure that that job is done. And I have found in, in this past year, my colleagues with whom I do not agree about everything, my colleagues and I sit down and battle it over um, with each other um, at, at lunch, out with each other at lunch, one at a time if, if need be, but we reach consensus or we don't vote on it. So if we, want a, if we want to continue that style of government, um, this is the team you need to elect. I'm certain that Mr. Hanauer didn't mean to just uh, admit that they are meeting uh, unannounced without public notice and discussing village business. One at a time, uh, it's not a three-person forum. Um, well, I've got about 35 years worth of national experience in business. Um, I've uh, worked in large corporations and had to deal with you know, that type of corporate bureaucracy. And also, my wife has been at IBM for about 30 years next year, and if, you know, sort of we consult on navigating that particular corporate bureaucracy. We've also uh, done startup of uh, businesses from one employee <coughs> to you know, 30 employees, multiple sites, and I uh, had to teach each person coming in how to do the job, uh, sort of re-engineer the jobs, um, teach people how to manage each other and to manage themselves and uh, to lay out an agenda. This is what has to be done at the end of the day and allow people to use their creative you know, skills and talent uh, to get that work done. I'm very good at that. I enjoy doing it because it's an opportunity to really see um, you know, the wealth and value of uh, the humanness of human beings. And um, I uh, really can't think of a situation where I've been uh, the manager where the people that I managed uh, didn't do the best. I do not have a formal education or degree in management. My only um, expertise is almost 40 years. I day-to-day -day manage four companies that I am involved with simultaneously. That is my work day from a quarter after five 
to about seven o'clock in the evening. So that is my that is my expertise. I'm a practical person that has made mistakes, learned from mistakes, and been successful. Never filed any bankruptcy. Never had spent any time in any courts regarding any financial uh, doom and gloom. My opponents and my detractors have put me as a micromanager, and I will give you a list of things that I was directly involved in. Developed reservoir parks, created, implemented village-wide park signing programs, expanded over 100 spaces of commuter parking, instituted Senior Citizens Week, built a hiring location for the day workers, improved the water filtration plant, implemented a zero program for drug designed a performance evaluation program for management employees, things of that nature. I can go on and on. But my point is, if that's what I need to do as your mayor, and you want to call me a micromanager, then I'm okay with that. I really am okay with that. It's not a bad thing. I'm a hands-on person. I'm the guy when the, when the DPW crew is in, the, in, in connecting a pipe and I come by and they're struggling with it, I jump in that same pit and help them connect the pipe. That's my style, because I want to get it done and move on. Thank you. And a little question. Bill Cowan, 73 Broadway, across the street from where uh, former Mayor Perillo used to live. Uh, it's interesting that this, I think this should end the, the discussion this evening. Mr. Hanauer answered one question I've had for, I think, almost two years, and that is why there were there seemed to be no issues uh, discussed in the village board. They're discussed on the village board, apparently. <laughs> and the comprehensive committee meeting. This is not a secret board. This is a board that is working very hard on behalf of the people of the village in a very public and inclusive way. We, we are all out there all the time listening to the villagers, to the wants and needs of the villagers so that it is not only the 10 people who come to every board meeting who have effect on us, it is everyone in the village who wants access to us who has effect on us. Uh, well, I just want to make one correction, unless I'm mistaken. I was the only person who videotaped the uh, 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 the other night and for Go TV and I haven't finished tagging it with graphics so it hasn't aired yet but it will shortly I promise <laughs> um, you know it, it is illegal to uh, meet uh, as a quorum on the village board of five that would be three people to discuss village business without proper notice to the public and um, you know I wasn't sure if I had heard the, you know what Mr. Van Howard saying before you know, without the qualification that it's only two at a group. I've seen the three of them wander around from time to time. I assume they're not discussing village business then. Certainly the impression